In Acts chapter 21, Paul and his ministry teammates met with the Jerusalem leadership who greeted them warmly and joyfully. Luke writes that the brothers in Jerusalem received them gladly. The following day after they had arrived, Paul and his teammates met with the Jerusalem church elders in a more formal setting. Luke writes that Paul told the elders in detail about all that God was doing among the Gentiles through his ministry. When the elders heard this, they glorified the Lord. So we initially see a very positive response here from the Jerusalem elders regarding Paul's ministry among the Gentiles. It's interesting that Luke only mentions James and the elders of the Jerusalem church. Whereas in Acts chapter 15, Luke writes that Paul and Barnabas had met in Jerusalem with the apostles and elders. Some scholars have suggested that some, or perhaps many of the original apostles, weren't in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21 when Paul and his team arrived. After all, the word apostle means sent one. And so it shouldn't really surprise us that Jesus' original disciples have now been sent out to the various parts of the world, just as Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, has also been sent out. Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1 that they would be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Recall that in Acts chapter 15, the apostles and elders had issued the Jerusalem decree, which had resolved a number of issues regarding Gentile Christianity. In Acts chapter 15, many Christian Judaizers had been falsely teaching that Gentile Christians needed to be circumcised and observe the Jewish ceremonial law. Paul and Barnabas had strongly opposed this, and they had disputed strongly with the Judaizers on this point. The Jerusalem Council had decreed that it wasn't necessary for Gentile converts to become circumcised or otherwise observe the ceremonial elements of the Law of Moses. Rather, Gentile Christians were to observe four requirements. First, to abstain from eating foods offered to idols. Second, to avoid strangled foods. Third, to avoid eating blood or meat with blood in it. And fourth, to avoid sexual immorality. Now, many years later, we find a different mood in the Jerusalem church upon Paul's arrival. In the minds of the Jerusalem elders, the pressing issue at hand was not regarding the Jerusalem decree, but something else. Rumors had been circulating that Paul was teaching Jewish Christians that they didn't need to observe any longer the Jewish ceremonial traditions of their forefathers. The elders told Paul, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. On the one hand, the Jerusalem elders themselves seemed to personally trust Paul as a brother in good standing, at least relationally. But publicly, Paul's status was now in question. Regardless of whether or not the rumors against Paul were true, the Jerusalem elders seemed to be mainly concerned with repairing and protecting their own public relations with all the unbelieving Jewish community, as well as appeasing any Judaizing factions within the Jewish church. In the event that the Jerusalem leadership were to publicly and unconditionally acknowledge Paul as a brother in good standing, this might end up suggesting to the unbelieving Jewish world, as well as to all the Judaizing factions within the church, that the leadership of the Jerusalem church was now officially endorsing Paul's ministry without any reservation. Then, the Jerusalem elders might very likely become persecuted for endorsing Paul. Some might assume that the Jerusalem church approved of Paul's rumored practice of encouraging Jews to abandon the ceremonial laws of Moses. In fact, the rumors against Paul were untrue. Paul was not teaching Jews not to circumcise their children. In fact, we can recall that Paul himself had Timothy circumcised before bringing him on his second missionary journey. Paul did this out of love for his Jewish brethren so that they wouldn't be offended, even though Timothy was only half Jewish. Timothy didn't consent to being circumcised as a condition for salvation, but rather out of freedom as a minister of Christ, so as not to create a stumbling block to his fellow Jews in hearing the gospel. The fact that Paul had Timothy circumcised shows clearly that Paul was not teaching Jews not to become circumcised. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 18, Paul instructs Christian Jews who are circumcised not to undo their circumcision, just as he tells Gentile Christians who are uncircumcised not to become circumcised. He goes on to explain, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, 
But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. By keeping the commandments of God, Paul, of course, means the moral law, which is summed up as loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving one's neighbor as oneself. This, not circumcision, is the essence of what God requires. This is the essence of what the grace of God produces in the believer. Love for God from the heart and love for one's neighbor. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6, verse 15, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Whether or not somebody has been circumcised is not really the point. The point is whether that person has been born again spiritually through faith in Jesus Christ. Concerning the law, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. It's sad when we realize that the Jerusalem leadership extended perhaps only a qualified acceptance of Paul, conditioned on his making a public showing to appease his critics. Paul had earlier written to the Thessalonian believers concerning his ministry. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Yet now we see Paul consenting to the Jerusalem leadership's request. Was Paul wrong to do this? Not necessarily. Remember that Paul had earlier told his friends in Caesarea, For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Perhaps Paul realized that the Jerusalem leadership were reacting in fear to the rumors concerning Paul. Yet in consenting to their request, Paul was not acting in fear, but rather in love. Love for the Jerusalem elders, who were his brothers in Christ, and love for his unbelieving Jewish countrymen. He writes, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. And to those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as the weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Let's learn from the humble example of the Apostle Paul demonstrated here. Let's learn to be motivated not by fear, but by love. As Christians set free through the grace of God in Christ, let's use this gift of freedom in Christ to serve those whom Christ loves. Let's learn how to become living epistles of the grace of God in Christ. Mm -hmm.